Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Say amen if you're there. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent is a 180. It means to turn around. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Don't get it skewed. Don't, don't get it confused because we have a lot of activities around here. This is our number one focus. And some of you have come in here with sins that have returned to your life. Sins come back into your life when you've missed your mission. Your purpose. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You can lay your Bibles down and get into this. I am scripture heavy in the beginning. I'll get to those as we read. I, I really don't plan on expounding a whole lot. I'm hoping you've come with a prepared heart and mind and realize, you know, I'm not just checking time here on a Wednesday night. I, I it's, it's what they call hump day in the world. It's, it's, it's a hard day, but we're made out of better stuff, firmer stuff, stalwart stuff. We're like, I'm going to get my new marching order so that Thursday and Friday, the world has to deal with me. Because come Saturday and Sunday, there's going to be a new name written down in glory because of the efforts that we're going to put out on our remission. Jesus, we love you. We need you. God, I pray that your word would go forth into the hearts and the minds and the spirits of all that here online and in the building today. Help us to, to really grasp the hold of what we need to be doing as the church in these last days. Shake us and wake us from our Americanism to become truly apostolic. And everybody said, Jesus' name. You can't be seated. You. Acts 20 and 28 makes a statement. It says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. You cannot lead. You cannot govern spiritually. You, you can't walk in the things of God without the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it, it's, the intimation here is to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And we all know that God is a spirit. So a spirit can't bleed. And so those confused in the oneness of God get confused because Jesus was the manifestation in the flesh of Almighty God. He robed himself in flesh because the Bible says to feed the, the, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The remission of sins is a new mission for your life. Let me say that again. I want my sins remitted. <laughs> Therefore, I obey scripture. I, 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 I get baptized in Jesus' name, and I have the name of Jesus invoked over me to fulfill the obedience of the word of God. Are you hearing me? That remission leads to my remission of my life. You see, before I, I was lost in sin, shaping in iniquity, fulfilling the works of the flesh, the distraction of the things of the world, and I was worldly. And hopefully, as we start turning and living for God, the Bible says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, well, I became a man, or I became mature, I put away childish things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Paul, speaking to Titus, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, he said, for, for, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, doesn't say it is salvation, you better hear what it's saying, have to appear to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Everybody say, I'm going to grow up. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's a change happening here. There's a refocus, a remission, a repurposing here that Paul is speaking to Titus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Looking for that blessed hope, not the blessed payoff, not the blessed comfort of the things of this world. Mm -hmm. 
but the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, the word and is Kai, which means even our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's not a duality. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's nothing there two. Who gave himself for us that we might, that he might redeem us. Everybody say redeem. Us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Amen. Amen. If you fit in, you're not peculiar. If you're doing what the Joneses are doing, and you're not doing what Jesus called you to do. From all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, good works don't save you. But good works is the product. And the good works are denoted by what the Bible talks about that are good works. Going through the Starbucks line and paying it forward for the person behind you, that's a nice thing to do, but that ain't going to get you in heaven. People say, oh, I'm a good person. He's not coming to save the good people. He's coming to save the saved people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. The word of God is our authority. Be careful when you want to stand in your opinion as I'm right. Oh, let God be true in every man alive. I need to be submitted to the word of God in my remission. Mm. Let no man despise thee. Paul, speaking to Titus, secures the commitment to the redirection and the remission the remission because of the remission of sins. We're not to go back. We're not to try to qualify or say, uh, I'm not in ugly sin or worldliness. I've been redeemed or redeemed, if you will. Paul tires, his entire life focus changed. And when he dealt with those that he worked with, he he uh, was talking about changing. Rome would not fear Christianity today. I don't believe the devil fears Christianity today. Very hard to find someone living in a way where you're turning your world upside down. In fact, if dad walked home and in the house today and flat turns over and thinks that that's it, we've had it with it. This is out of here. Some of you'd balk and give him a hard time. Well, who do you think you are? The Bible says in Acts 17 and 6, and when they found them, what does it say them? Are there any them in here tonight? When they found them not, they couldn't find those that were causing problems. They drew Jason and certain brethren under the rules of the city crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. If they went looking today, if they went down your street and my street and your street, they ain't going to be pulling any of us out. Mm, are you looking like the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world? Are you living a life that the worldly are worried about? Is your Christianity a threat to worldliness? Man, I should rather answer these questions right now. I'd like the fact to know that I, I, could, I could turn around tomorrow and, and change my life. I could realize, you know what? I, I get it. I guess I got kind of a Christianity, but I'm really not turning the world upside down. Maybe I need to check myself in the proclivities or the things that I've allowed that I can qualify my worldliness. But when I get down in prayer in the spirit of God, do are these things really expedient for me? Redeemed. Redeemed means... And it's an early 15th century word. It means to buy back, ransom, recover by purchase. Anybody been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? If you've been bought with a price, if you've been bought by the blood of the why aren't we doing what we were bought for? Remember when I talked about that guarantee and warranty? If it don't live up, you want to take it back? I wonder how many God, my man, I'd just like to take you back. <laughs> not, not just hypothetical. God, God, God wants, he loves you. Don't get that wrong. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. I remember the days. I don't even know if they do that now because 
I'm really trying to stay away from soda pop. But I remember when we first moved back over here from England, there was this amazing thing. Used to get Coke bottles used to come in glass. Anybody here? In fact, if you go to the Davenport's house, they got, I don't know if that's even real Coke in there, but they got them old glass bottles of Coke on the front porch as a decoration. Well, they might be worth some money, so if you can go get them things, might get some money out of them and take them back. <laughs> you used to take them, we used to take them, and, 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 and uh, there was a, a big wooden rack, you'd take them back, and you they would redeem those, and you'd Get another case and take it home. We were buying cases at a time. And God, that stopped. I might be as big as that baptismal right now if we didn't. But basically, they were redeemed. Bought. They bought them back from you. Because they wanted to reuse it because they had a purpose for it. They're going to refill it and send it out to do a work. Oh, I don't know. Am I the only one that sees a parallel here? I'm all by myself. It had a mission for it, so it remissioned it. Oh, okay. So that word re, in fact, Sister Carla got a little dose of this today as she came to pick up our amazing first lady to take her as she goes on a little trip with family this weekend. Remission. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, when we use the word remission today, we always think of what? Cancer. So the National Cancer Institute has the definition of disappearance of the signs and symptoms of cancer. Well, I want, I want to live in such a way that the signs and symptoms of worldliness is just dis- dis- getting less and less. It's just connected to me less. And as I get older, I just want less and less. I, I want my mind and my heart and my direction and my focus to be more. And I want to know that I'm maturing and growing and haven't stagnated. I, 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 you, know, you know, I don't mind getting old. I just don't want to become useless. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. So the cancer, National Cancer Group says when this happens, the disease is said to be in remission. It's, 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 it's leaving, it's dissipating. Sin, like a disease, is genetically inherited. We all have it. We were all born in sin. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all sin to come short of the glory of God. Sin does not satisfy. Let me finish. Sin can bring real pleasure. I'm not, not going to deny that. That's why sin is powerful. But there is no lasting satisfaction to sin. Hebrews 11.25, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Moses stepped out of the opulence that the world had to offer to step in to the mission of the kingdom of God. Think about that. Sin enslaves you. Because when you sin... You tie yourself up or even tie yourself to something. Are you hearing me? Achan, his family lost out because Achan was tied to the sin that brought defeat to Israel. The Bible talks about the sins of the fathers visited upon the children. And even under the third and fourth generation, there's something about the men. We need to be careful about what we allow. Are you hearing me? And so instead of the sinner being free and the believer being in bondage, it's really the reverse. Proverbs 5.22 says, The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of sin hold him fast. You see, I I know a lot of things. Well, I like that. I'm going to keep that. But you don't realize that liking and that loving and that procuring. It's, in, it's enslaved and ensnared you. I, I saw this uh, meme the other day where this one dog that was free to run around the yard and there was another dog that had a chain on him. And so the dog with the toy went over and laid it just, just Carol, just out of reach of that dog and stood there looking at him. 
and the other one's just pulling against that chain and pulling against it. And, and, and finally, the other dog just put it down on the ground and walked away and left that toy there. Many of us are like that chain dog because we won't let go of those things of the world. We never get to the real prize. Are you hearing me? Sin degrades. The things that we even like, the things that we make permissible, degrades our ability to advance, to level up. Because we become satisfied. Satan loves to mock the human race. Oh, no, you, you, you need to understand what I, when, I, when I say that. He loves to see the pinnacle of God's creation, you and I, the apple of his eye, tossing and turning, wasting that fearfully and wonderfully made person, wallowing in worldliness or wallowing in distraction, wallowing or even getting to that place where you're you're tossing and turning in guilt and shame and drowning in embarrassment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The devil loves to humiliate you and I. But Jesus loves to shower us with his glory and honor. That's why he took our shame, because sin shames us. How many of us know you've been called to something higher? Be careful now. Don't, don't jump up but you realize because of some of your chains that you've allowed yourself to get tied to keep you from getting there. You just, how many of us have made a deal with it and you've just become satisfied? Ecclesiastes 10 and 1 says, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to get off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. Mm. Shameful. I, I, I don't want to be ashamed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sin steals joy. Sin steals your joy. Never underestimate the, the importance of joy. I, sometimes we, we talk about it like it's only a Christmas time thing, and it's not. Nehemiah 8 and 10 says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Some of us have, have never held on to that joy, and that's so so... Some of us are so easy to give up joy for pleasure. That, that, that pleasure for a season, it's fun for a little while, but no lasting effect from it. It's not an eternal treasure that it just was for a moment. Well, that was fun while it lasted. Well, how long could it really last? Uh, Psalm, Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life in my presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore sin just kind of just just explodes the the presence of joy and breaks that communion with god and causes that negativity to, to penetrate because sin simply separates us from joy it's hard to have joy in the presence of god when you got that lurking thing in your heart and your mind it's hard to think that, yeah, I get excited about God when you know it's sitting at the door and you haven't laid it down and you know you're going to pick it up when you get home. You just have lost out the joy in leveling up in the things of God or going further in the things of God. Isaiah says in 59 and 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. See, the world don't talk like this today because you have to understand it's really not what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to have less and less world as we mature and less and less desire of those things. Or maybe not the, 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 the end of the desire, but the mental aptitude to say, oh, oh, I got something bigger on my mind. And your sins have hid his face from you. They were not here. That shed some pretty clear light that today's Christianity is devoid of honesty when it teaches that you can do what you want and still be saved. Can the Lord order your steps? Oh, this is an old, I haven't used this in years, and I just thought of it. I, I remember reading an illustration, and because of my Native American heritage, it, it really stuck with me. And 
there was this Indian chief that just just had heard about Christianity and all his all his life he'd heard about that great spirit. And so he 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 built an altar in the woods by himself one day and he took his pride, his prized possessions of his of his of his tomahawk and laid it on there and lifted his hands to the Lord and nothing happened. And then then he pulled out his 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 knife and sheathed and, and, and laid it on there and nothing happened. And he, he he went ahead and pulled his bow and his arrows and highly coveted valuable things for, for him. And he, he laid it on the altar and lifted his head and, and, and nothing. And, and he, he was distraught as to what he could do. And then it dawned on him and he, he pushed all those things aside and he laid himself on the altar and lifted his hands and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. There's got to be something about us that when I get that remission of sins, it's to get a remission for my life. Here I got a new mission. I, I got a new call. I, I got a new direction. God just didn't call me uh, to save me, but he called me so that I can serve. Remission takes repentance. I said remission takes repentance. It's a turning around and, and redoing with my life uh, what I used to do, even laying down all the things, whether they're sin or not, so that I could complete the mission given from the remission. Are you hearing me? We change direction. Repentance is that 180. It is that term that even the uh, soldiers use today when they make a turn or change direction. They use the term repent. Repentance is turning to move closer to God and away further from the world. Romans 6 and 23 declares, for the wages of sin is death. Can it be said our sinful doings earn a hell's wage? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Holy Ghost is the gift and it leads and it guides us. That's why Acts 2.38 is so important for the remission of sins because John 16 and 13 declares, how be it when he the spirit of truth has come, will guide you into all truth. I'm, I'm telling you, we've got to get back to that place. And I was talking with someone the other day about the good old days and, and how church services used to be and how people used to live for God. Let me tell you something. that We had preachers that drove around. All they had was a car, a vehicle, and they would preach and God would move and people would be slain in the spirit. See, the problem is, is we got a Christianity without sacrifice today. It's foreign. Y'all looking at me like I'm nuts. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. You online are going, man, I'm not giving nothing up. Well, you, 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 God can't fill where there's no void. There's more for you if you'll make room for it. For he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and will show you things to come. Ha. How can you have a future in the things of God if you won't make room for it? How can you do more for God if you won't make room for it? I, I tell you, you want to you wanna, you wanna see a pastor get lit on fire by someone in the church. I'll then walk in and tell me, you know what, pastor, I'm giving this up. I've done, I, I, I tell you what, I, I get lit up by that, by someone saying, you know what, I've dedicated that. I'm going to teach Bible studies. This, I'm going to go on outreach here. I, I'm getting prayed. You know, this may not even be sin, but I'm laying it aside so that I can make room. You want to see revival take place. Find people of sacrifice. Find people that want the reason for the remission. Are you hearing me? The wages of sin is still death. Actually, sin brings death from the start. It always has, and it always kills something in us when we transgress. It assaults our sensitivity. Listen to me. Sin and worldliness will assault your sensitivity to God. You ever sat there and wonder why I can't feel what they feel? Why does that person, why does that person go to that level? Why, why, how does that person, if we're all made the same and God's no respect to repair, how does someone with less do more, how does someone like David do more than a saw? Sacrifice. How, how is it that we got people like a Gideon that, that stood out from the crowd? How, how is it that, that some upstart with 
Nothing can do more with some that had everything handed to him. Sacrifice. Just willing to go far, farther to sacrifice. It's all it is. It, ass it, it assaults our sensitivity. It trashes our conscience. Sister Carol, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Sister Carol, all you that need a healing, it tears up my conscience. You see, I, there's been times in my life I've laid hands on people and they were healed. There's times I just lay hands on people and they burst out speaking in tongues. There have been times that I was used God's gifts are without repentance. He didn't take them from me. I'm gonna, what's the hold up here? What's the hold up here? Mm. Now y'all looking at me like, yeah, I better stop. You know, even Jesus couldn't do many works because of unbelief. I just wonder if there's some people here, man. You, I know you've been around a long time. You, you've been in the presence of God week after week here, month after month. But I wonder if there's a level of sacrifice that needs to invade each of our lives so that we can get back to the mission that the remission said. I, I wonder if there's anybody. I thank you, Brother Bruce, for standing and realizing, you know what? The, there's ought to be something about it. If you're really apostolic, you should walk in and survey your house. Survey your, hey, what's it going to take? For the church that I attend, that I'm a, if you're a pillar here, are you holding anything up? What's it going to take for us to go to that next level? Your dismissal or your sacrifice? Are you, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Come on, let's be honest. Worldliness. Trashes our conscience and mauls our willpower. Oh, I, 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 I don't expect you to get behind me on this and enjoy this, but I just wonder. Mr. Christ, I hope you didn't just read that because it sounded good, even though it did and it was beautiful, but I hope it inspired you to another level. I hope when you get up to lead sermon, you're not just looking sort of, but that we really feel like I'm going to sacrifice my praise and my worship and my time and my effort, and I'm here to change today so that my remission launches me on my real mission. I, I believe it's fair to say that every time we sin or every time we table or shove aside sacrifice or going to another level, something in us dies. And then... At the end of the road, when sin says pay up, I don't want to look back. And sadly, just because of me, I don't want to look back and see all the things God had for me left on the table because I didn't get myself in the right position for it. I wonder if maybe some of the greatest moves of God didn't happen because I wasn't really ready to move in the things of God. I wasn't ready for God to order my step. None of us likes to be ordered around. That's the spirit of the age. Don't you tell me I got to come to an altar. Don't you tell me I got to lift my hands. Don't you tell me I should pray more. But yet the Bible says every one of those things. The Bible says too much is given, much is expected. We turn around and I can, I, hey, I'm an elder here. Why would I look around for, 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 for some of you new, newer folks to where I, I think I ought to be worshiping and praising it? I think I should, still, I should still be here on time for prayer. You want to see an indictment? Walk in here as an elder late for prayer. You brought a reproach, not revival. Is that, is that too hard? That hurt your little feelings? I'm sorry, but you need to understand Worldliness and sin fascinates before it assassinates. If you have to demand respect instead of be given it because of how you live, something's wrong. Galatians 6, listen to this. Listen, 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 listen. 
Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, what you do, what you're doing with your resources, your time, your life, your thoughts, your heart, that shall he also reap. Some of you have been real successful. How do you know? Look at your life. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap, of the flesh reap corruption. You got a whole bunch of stuff that's going to perish. I got a bunch of stuff that's going to perish. Sadly, I buy more and more every day. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I just wonder where, where my balance is really at. The balance that matters. Not my bank account balance, but my heaven balance. I wonder how much treasure I really have in the account that matters. Is this fair to say that the, the guilt... of us mocking God as Christians is pretty widespread. The concept of reaping what we've sown is well known, that, well known, but seldom self-applied to Christianity today. Because how many are going to get up and say, you know what? I need to give up more for the church today. I need to give up more for the kingdom of God. Ouch. Not now, man. Christmas is coming. And so can I say it like it is? And so just like cancer, sin and worldliness starts invading. We don't realize to the degree that it is. And the only way that it can be dealt with is remission. I need a remission for my life. There's a new... Testament word for you, remission. You know, it's from the same Greek root, Ephesus, as the word forgiveness. Forgiveness and remission are basically synonyms. Their definitions kind of overlap. The real difference in the words is not directly in their meaning, but in their focus. Oh, I'm really talking about focus tonight. What's your focus? Forgiveness speaks of a removal of one's anger toward another. Remission has to do with the release of a debt, penalty, or obligation. The, the former of forgiveness focuses on the inward healing, while the latter focuses on the external consequences. Remission is closer in meaning to the concept of pardon than is forgiveness, and therefore is used more in a legal way, referring to the discharging of guilt and payment our wrongdoing. Sin. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 15-1, I'm going to read you a couple of different versions of how it talks about sin in the Old Testament way of dealing with sin. It says, at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. In the NIV, it says, at the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. Another version says, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debts. Another one says, at the end of every seven years, you sh must grant remission. And the message says, at the end of every seventh year, cancel all debts. Remission was paid for by the blood of Jesus, by that sacrifice, that, that amazing sacrifice. That sacrifice was the benefit for our remission. It was sacrifice. It was in the garden saying, not my will, but thy will. Sacrifice is amazing, beautiful word for you and I that received the benefit. Well, maybe I'm by myself here tonight. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see, he's perfected it. He's in Hebrews 9, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood. Can I say sacrifice is no remission? Are you hearing me? I wonder the only way we can get our mission because of our remission is to get back to sacrifice. <laughs> 
Baptism brings remission of sins. In Luke 44, 47, that that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Matthew 28, 19, this is a parallel passage. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Is there any willing to sacrifice to go teach all nations? Mm, Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When's the last time you taught somebody that? I'm not talking in here. When's the last time you've been responsible for someone being taught that? When's the last time your life was about the mission of the church? When was the last time you took your remission and got a remission for your life and said, I'm going to go about my father's business? Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's still necessary. It was necessary for Cornelius' household in Acts 10, 43. It says, to, to give all the prophets witness, and through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's 10 and 43. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. How many are hearing the word from you? And they of the circumcision, which... Let me tell you something. I, you young guys, you already heard this from me. I, I'm, I want you to become a soul winner before you're a good preacher. Because that, sadly, some people miss the mission. They think you've got to be a good preacher without being a soul winner. That's, that's, that, that's, a, that's from a devil's hell. That, that's ruined more good saints than anything. And they of the circumcision which believe were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with Tongues, I don't know about you, but we need a downpour. We, we, we need a deluge of the Holy Ghost in here on anyone. I don't care if you've spoken in tongue before. You need to get that remission applied and be led of the Lord by the Holy Ghost to lead and guide you into all truth. You set it aside and pick the toys and trinkets and habits and hobbies of the world. We need to get about the mission of the church and magnify God. Then answered Peter. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain hours. Oh, yeah, you would be asked to stay. Teach me more. I want the Holy Ghost that you're speaking of. I want the Holy Ghost that's leading and guiding your life. How can someone even know there be any Holy Ghost if they don't see it in your life, the way you live? How can, if they don't see the remission working in your life, in your remission? Mm. Let's stand. The danger of this message is you can't unhear it. You're responsible for it. If we're all told that those, I think they're eight-sided. What are stop signs? Are they eight-sided? Six-sided, eight-sided? Are they off the go? What are they? Those aren't up for debate. They're not yield signs. They're not green go signs or lights. They mean, what do they mean? All the time? Or just when I like it? It's funny that this world has so much control and we obey it to a T. And we hear the word of God. And we claim to be Christians. We claim to be apostolic. We claim... And like, like, hey, I'm guilty. Oh, I like the good old days. You know what? The good old days are still today if we'll be good old saints. Oh. Look down at the front of your, look down at the front of your shoes right now. Those are my footprints. Not because I'm upset. But God has a mission for you. Are you hearing me?
You see, when the word remission is found in the form of a verb, which is to remit, it has the added meaning of sending. Separation. Departure. Cessation, completion, and reversal. That's why as a Christian, as a saint of God, as a preacher, we are much like a doctor. Because when someone gets baptized in the name of Jesus, of a Savior who can put your disease of sin into remission. The greatest disease is sin. And you've been sent out as doctors with the remedy. How many of you, if you saw someone laying there dying and had the exact medical need in your hand, would just keep on walking by? But yet we do it in the spirit. Day in. Every one of us, every one of us, look around this room and see every empty chair there's someone out there bleeding. There's somebody out there going to spend eternity somewhere. It's a sad day that I'm more burdened about my hobbies than humanity. That I'm more burdened about my likes than what God loves. Oh, that something would happen to me today. Oh, that I would be a church that's back in the re-business. You see, the prefix re or re, as you see in parenthesis on our overhead, means to use to add the meaning or do again. To rebuild. To reuse. When you and I took on the blood of Jesus at baptism, you were born again into a new life mission and purpose. Everybody say re. re. Mission. Re. You have a new life purpose. Don't let church be something you attend on Sundays and Wednesdays. Be it something you live every day. Or well, we will hear, you and I will hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. Everybody say re. re. Purpose. purpose. What's your purpose? Mark said it so clearly. He was so descriptive. And he said, unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That ought to arrest every one of us in our spirit. That ought to lead us to that place of sacrifice, of burden. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because he, if he says, depart from me, I never knew you, then there's something more than just believing. There's an activity. Because I've been remissioned. I've been repurposed. You see, it's a dying art. I remember with my dad, and, and y'all y'all think of it as kind of a low thing, but Man, I can't tell you how many times my dad and I go into the dump. We brought stuff home. I know Brother Davenport's with me on this. You, you, I tell you what, y'all can laugh at it and mock it, but I promise you, you get yourself in trouble and you can find some little part. That old guy over there probably got it sitting in his backyard. That's how my dad was. I, I remember in a field on the other side, we had property on both sides of a road. On the other side, man, it was duck work. <laughs> Everything. I, we'd go play in a maze out there. There was so much stuff. But geez, my dad, you know, building houses and building corrals and bit, never lacked for it. He, home, they didn't even have Home Depot back then. Yeah, all they had was a lumber yard. Going to the lumber yard, boy. Get a bag of nails. Bought it by weight. Learned all kinds of languages from my dad when he'd hit his thumb with that hammer. I learned how a hammer got used. I tell you what, I, I have these vague 
remembrances of trying to pick a hammer up, other things of just, he had me around it so that I know how to do it. I hope that when you're here and around it, it's so you learn how to go and do it. We've been remissioned. We've been repurposed. We've, 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 we've just something new added to our lives. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. I, I want to see people healed. I want to see our young people, not on Riddler, not on drugs, but healed and, and whatever's oppressing them. Get delivered from it because we're repurposed. We should not be satisfied with someone le leaving unhealed or unfilled, we ought to realize maybe I'm the reason. I could have been the one that prayed for them. I could have been the one that taught the Bible study. I could have been the one that baptized them. I could. You see, the enemy wants you on the sidelines and out of circulation. You have no purpose. You have no mission. You just have a seat. Oh. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. We dealt with this. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Hey, church, isn't it time we fulfill the will of God in our lives? That's not just for them. That's for me. That's for you. I heard a, a phrase a long time ago, and I, and I looked it up today and realized it goes to a poem. It says, two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, greatly pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Many of us have been here and heard me preached about Jeremiah taking the marred vessel. I take license today to believe that every one of us have a form of marring, a flaw. I appreciate the sincerity of those that will come to me and say, I, I want to do better. I got plenty of people coming up and telling me how I need to do and I need to tell this person that and tell that. Well, I, those people that if you if you've ever done that, I, I love it if you come to an altar night and say, God, I need to do better. I'm a flawed vessel. And like Jeremiah 18, 4 and 6, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you. Somebody say me. I can allow a marring or a hindering or something in my life that stops or hinders me from being used. But the beautiful thing of the story says so. He made it again another vessel. He didn't find new clay. He'll take your clay and he'll make you another vessel that's usable because he, he used it to say, the word of the Lord came unto the Jeremiah, oh, house for can I not do with you as this part? Anybody want to be used? Anybody want to be redeemed? Get, take me back. Make me, shape me. Refill me and send me out again, Lord. Psalms 107 and 2 starts out with this phrase, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah. Let me say so tonight. I've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy to gather people out of the hand of the enemy. I've got a remission. I've got a repurpose. Are you hearing me? How many here believe you've been redeemed for a purpose? If you've been redeemed for a greater purpose, I want you to come forward. 
if you want a greater purpose, if, if, if you want the greatest purpose handed to humanity on the planet, I want you to hear something here. Mark says it. I like how all that peer pressure worked. I hope. I really hope. Just tune everybody else out. Tune your spouse out. Tune everybody else out. Listen. Listen to what Jesus says here. And Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul. Are you hearing me? Mm. With all thy mind and with all thy strength, all those aspects of who you are. You got to remember on the other side of this that, that, that we may have known each other as a wife or a son or a daughter but it ain't going to matter over there like it does here. You got to work out your own salvation with fear. You ought to be able to turn to whoever it is. I got to be about my father's. I may love you, but you got to understand my love is first towards him or I'll be no good to you. Let's not talk right now. I'm preaching. I don't want no one distracted. This is the first commandment, but he didn't stop there. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other command, commandment greater than these. When you're born again, we're just not putting you down in water to get you wet. We all know that it's the obedience that sets the mission at play. When you're born again, you're born into a greater mission. It doesn't end with baptism. It starts. It doesn't stop with getting the Holy Ghost. It's launched. You were born into a greater mission into a, we call it today, the great co-mission. When you're, when you're walking and talking with Jesus, there's a mission that you're mindful of. And I believe it's high time for everyone here tonight to discover again the true mission and purpose for your life. When you breathe your last breath, like the poem that I just read, what treasure have you placed in heaven? Don't fit the church into your life. Fit your life into the church. It's the only thing he's coming for. Of all the things you value, of all the things that you think have importance. He's coming for a church. Humanity's purpose was struck down in the garden by disobedience. It was Christ's submitted commitment in the garden that we are granted the grace and opportunity into our repurpose, our redemption, our re. Mission. Remission. Your new birth mission. Should you honestly choose to accept it. Is to live for God. And to love your neighbor. As yourself more. That your greatest concern. Is that you turn the world upside down. And make sure there's no confusion that you are about your father's business because that second greatest commandment is to love thy neighbor enough to take up your cross and follow Christ. These are the only deeds in life that will amount to anything in heaven. Psalms 90 and 12 tells us and it mandates, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. 